Good morning, Lambs Fellowship. Welcome church, welcome virtual church, welcome surrounding communities to the Lambs Fellowship Lake Elsinore service this morning, church service on June 14th, 2020. Come on, we're gonna raise a hallelujah. We're gonna set the table for our new lead pastor, Pastor Mike John Perkinson. Today is the first day that he's gonna bring a message, a sermon to be able to teach us. So hallelujah, today is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Come on, get on your feet and let's raise a hallelujah this morning.
praise a hallelujah.
Amen, everyone. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? No one can stop our Lord, and no one is going to stop us for continuing in an attitude of worship as we bring in a time of prayer. So, Father, will you accept this time of praise and prayer as we turn our hearts to lifting up the desires of our hearts to you, our intercessor, Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we know that the Holy Spirit is in our midst, and we declare you our way maker, our promise keeper, our light in the darkness. And we know that, Father, you never change. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. So, Lord Jesus, if that is who you are, we declare your greatness, we declare your glory, and we know that you are moving in our midst as we continue to worship you. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship. Sing that again. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. Who you are. 
praise you, Father, for allowing us to come to lift up our prayers and our praise to you. We know, Father, you are tireless. You are unceasing in your love. You are forever faithful and forever true as we have raised our hallelujahs to the almighty King that no one can ever stop. And Father, you make a way. You are the way maker to eternal glory. And Father, we praise and we pray this in your name. And all God's people said, Amen. Would you welcome for the first time ever at the Lambs Fellowship Lake Elsinore, our own pastor, Mike Chong. Hi, Saints of Lambs. It's so good to be with you. Um, man, I wish we could be in person meeting and preaching to you via um, uh, a camera is not my preferred mode. However, I'm grateful we have this option to be able to at least connect. And so I just want to say we are, we are excited that God has called us down to Lambs. Uh, we are shocked that God has called us down to Lambs. I, I just want to say before I get into anything that God must really love Lambs. Uh, I was minding my own business up here in Crossroads in Big Fork, Montana. God was moving, is moving. We are seeing all kinds of growth, even through the pandemic. Um, every indicator is up. We're growing like crazy. And, uh, and then God yanked us down to lambs. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we were trying to find our way up here to purchase a home uh, just at the first week of April. And about three weeks later, as I discovered my name had been submitted to lambs, I uh, was meeting with uh, conference superintendent Glenn Pryor, who said this statement, uh, lambs has a lot to offer and we're surprised that we can't find the right pastor. And when he said that, the Lord put his finger on my heart and said, it's you, which caught me completely off guard. And uh, it's right. We're excited. Uh, we are going through a, a season of mourning uh, here because we so love the saints of Crossroads. Matter of fact, uh, this video is being shot by the, the creative arts pastor, Scott Moore, at Crossroads. So he's gifting it to you. I'm being prayed over by one of our intercessors who has prayed for me the whole time I've been here, Ken Kelly. Crossroads has uh, prayed over you a, a prayer of reception, a receiving, that you might be able to receive us. So they're gifting us to you, sending us to you. And so it's a beautiful relationship and uh, we are thrilled, 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 thrilled to be here. And so God's in this. And so I just want to make a couple comments uh, before I go on. Uh, In-person gatherings, uh, I, we're taking a look at all the governor has laid out in, uh, in the guidelines and uh, we're trying to make a safe decision for us to gather, want to gather as soon as possible. Proverbs Proverbs 14, 15 says this, the simple believes everything, but the prudent gives thought to his steps. So we want to give a lot of thought to the steps, the guidelines to make sure that we put you in love's way, not harm's way. And right now it looks like the restrictions are 25% uh, uh, of the building, which a uh, max of 100 people, which uh, would be difficult for us. So we're going to figure it out. I'll, I'll shoot a video uh, next week that'll talk about uh, how we might do that as I pray with and talk with the staff to figure that out in the next few weeks. So uh, hopefully we'll be gathering soon. So keep, keep on praying uh, for what God has in store for us. So I called you saints. I just want you to say wherever you are, uh, would you say I'm a saint? I'm hearing you. I'm a saint. You can type that. I'm a saint. Uh, you're a saint not because of what you and I have done. You're a saint because of what God has done. So why would I call you saints? The Bible calls you saints. So when you open up the epistles, the, the letters are to the saints. Of Matter of fact, even the church at Corinth, which is like a modern day Las Vegas, I mean, they are sinning galore. Uh, Paul calls them saints. So you are a saint. Uh, and, and hopefully you don't define yourself by your sin anymore. You define yourself by what Jesus Christ has done. You are a saint. So one more time, would you say, I am a saint. Now, a couple ground rules before I get going. So we're on camera and uh, I, I, need to, I need you to be typing and saying some things. I'm an interactive preacher. So if we were live, I'd need you to talk to me. I, I love interactions. So uh, if you can say preach it, that would help. If, if you can say amen, if you can do a shout out, that would be awesome because our God is an amazing God. 
Saints, we live in a crazy time. Uh, COVID-19 uh, has been difficult for so many of us. Uh, some of us have lost loved ones, uh, undergone the sickness. Some of us are struggling with the economic realities. It's a difficult time. So what do you do when trials come, when you're struggling with the difficulties of life? I, I want to take you to the Gospel of Mark. We're going to take a little bit of time in the Gospel of Mark uh, uh, in this message today. It, it, it's a radical gospel that calls us to a radical life of faith. It starts right in verse 1 of Mark. Here begins the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Here begins the good news about Jesus. It's a radical call to faith. And you might not think much of it, but I want to put it in context for you in the gospel of Mark. Uh, it's written to a, a community of saints who are minding their own business. They're loving Jesus. And there's a ruler named Nero. We're dating the gospel of Mark in the early 60s about 30 years after the death of Jesus. You've got Nero, who's ruling, who's trying to create a, a, an urban renewal program. He wants to reinstitute a new Rome. And in so doing, he sets fire to the city and he burns down 10 of the 14 districts. And, and the plan is, is backfiring. He, he needs a scapegoat to, to help him uh, uh, get this plan across the Senate, which isn't being received well. And he finds this fledgling group that's rapidly growing underground all over Rome called Christians. And so he blames the Christians and, and he finds some narcs, some people who will tell their whereabouts. Uh, they're meeting in catacombs and hidden places to keep their lives preserved. And so he finds them. And as a result of this man who is crazed and demonized, if you will, he then uh, has soldiers break into the houses of these Christians when he finds the whereabouts, pulls out the moms and dads and the kids. And then he takes them at nighttime and, and he uses them to light the streets. They become human torches. He puts them into the games where, where the lions and tigers, the gladiators, uh, eat them up and chew them up while, while, while screaming fans are, are cheering on this horrific display of murder and death. So I want you to imagine that you're minding your own business, loving Jesus, just trying to follow God. And here comes a crazed man who then takes your family. So fathers, you, you lose your, 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 your wife and your kids. Mothers, you lose your, your spouse and your husband and your children that we end up dying for no reason other than a crazed man's urban renewal program. Gospel of Mark is that book where Mark pastors his people and calls them to a radical life of faith. It's in that context, 1-1 one, one says, here is the good news, the euangelion, the good news of Jesus, that in the midst of all this suffering, there's hope, and you might ask, as many of us would, how can there be hope in, in the middle of all that? So chapter one, if you go down just a few more verses, 12 and 13 is an interesting way that Mark highlights the, the temptation. Uh, Matthew and Luke give us a greater de, a de, depiction of the temptation narrative when Satan comes to Jesus and tempts him, tempts him and tells us of the interaction between the two. Mark doesn't give us the interaction. It says in verse 12 of chapter 1, immediately one of Mark's favorite words in the first three chapters, the, the gospel starts out in a hurry immediately. The Holy Spirit compelled Jesus to go into the wilderness. You ever felt compelled to go into the wilderness? You might be in it now. That's what some of us feel like. We're, we're in a wilderness. Compelled to go into the wilderness. He was there for 40 days being tempted by Satan. There's, there's no record of the dialogue. It says this. He was out among the wild animals and angels took care of him. You ever felt that paradox in life where on one side are wild animals biting at you, demons, the minions of hell biting at you, and on the other side are the, the ministering angels that you're caught between this dissonance, this uh, polarity uh, of struggle and demise and evil and darkness and, and God caring for you. It leaves us in chapter one with Jesus being trapped between the two. It's a, it's a reality that the, the saints of Mark's gospel are struggling with the difficulty of life. And that's where a lot of us are. And of course, not only we have COVID, we've got a, a, a nation that's falling apart. It's crumbling. It's, it's divided. And our hearts are broken over this polarity that exists in our world. I believe God's calling the church up. I believe God's calling lambs up. I believe we have a radical mission that what God began with Pastor Gary Ennis 23 years ago, I am privileged to come and, and see that through to the, to the next place, the phase of what God would have for us at lambs. God is calling you out in the middle of all this struggle. I believe, there's, I believe there's, we're dripping with hope, the hope of Jesus Christ, a radical call to faith. And so I just want to challenge you. 
But our problem is hell comes and he, he works with our perception. And I, I want to remind you that whatever you perceive is what becomes real. Our perception dictates everything. It, it's the Numbers 13, 33 passage. We were like grasshoppers in our own eyes, so we were to them. And so there's this cute little quote that goes something like this. I'm not who I think I am. I'm not who you think I am. I'm who I think you think I am. I'll say that again. I'm not who I think I am. I'm not who you think I am. I'm who I think you think I am. The perception of myself, how I view myself, is predicated. What is what predicates and dictates reality. It's what sets reality in motion for me. And so it's not what I think I am. It's what I think you think I am. And so my, my identity shifts with every human being I'm around. So if I think you think I'm stupid, I feel stupid. If I think you think I, 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 I'm smart, I feel smart. That I, I somehow am responsible for my own perception. And what hell wants to do is deceive that so that we see everything from a darkened lens of struggle and an absence of God's presence. So the core emotion, and we'll talk a lot about this in, in the years to come, the core emotion of all human beings since the fall of our first parents, Adam and Eve, is, is fear and it's, its cousin, shame. We're born with this sense of, of shame and fear and then it's given a specific name as you are raised in, in a home, in our culture. And then if, if that is the core emotion, the response to that, the core motivation is self-protection. We're guarded and, and we protect ourselves and, and we should. And if that's the case, then the core strategy is hiding and facades. And so we have uh, the saints of God who often end up hiding and we're afraid and we're broken when we're empowered people. Because on one side we have, we have the wild beast and we have the minions of hell. We, they're yapping at us, barking at us and biting us. And, and we don't know what's going on and, and there's ministering angels, but we feel caught between the two and there doesn't seem to be relief. And there's a Nero running around and, and he's, he's coming after us and there's darkness and defeat everywhere. And so it's hard at times, saints, to to be encouraged, to, to live a life of faith. And I believe that God has so much for you. You are a saint. Would you say one more time, I'm a saint. And so I want to encourage you this morning as we think through what God has for us, that there is hope. Would you say, in Christ, I can do all things. In Christ, I can do all things. The way to simplify that is in Christ, I'll make it. Let's go back to the Gospel of Mark as I, as I close out with you. Today, chapter 14 is where Jesus prophesies to Peter after Peter's made the uh, uh, incredible promise and the, uh, the braggadocious statement, though, even though everyone else falls away, I'm, I'm above everyone else, I won't. And Peter gets told by Jesus that before the cock crows twice tonight, you're going to deny me three times. We, we've all denied the Lord. We've all been unfaithful. I've been unfaithful. I'm just a whacked out Asian buffoon who's, who hasn't been the man he's been called to be at times. It's been God's grace, still God's grace. I'm here because God's grace. And it's always God's grace. So, so Peter is told and prophesied over by Jesus that he's going to deny him. And then, of course, Jesus is arrested that night. It's a, it's a catastrophic night for the disciples. Their, their dream is being taken from them. Their, their hope is being uh, taken to a court, and eventually they're going to watch their hope die. But I want to take you to verse 65 of chapter 14 and a very interesting uh, couple verses that says this, as Jesus is now uh, out with the soldiers and he's blindfolded. And of course, they're having a heyday with him. Tragic verse that disturbs me greatly to read it. And some of them began to spit at him, and they blindfolded him and hit his face with their fists. The precious, powerful Son of God, who spoke everything into existence by a word, this, this being, this man who's poured himself into an earth suit, is making himself vulnerable to the human beings he spoke into existence. The fists that he created, called forth, are punching him. And they say, who hit you that time, you prophet. They jeered, they mock him. And even the guards were hitting him as they led him away. It seems as if all hell is breaking loose and winning. Nero is triumphing. The, how, how are we going to make it with our financial situation? I'm in stage four cancer. What am I going to do that my spouse has left? Had no idea. What you, you know. 
the minions, the, the wild beasts are chomping and biting at us and we're bleeding and profusely want, and, and, and wondering if we're ever going to make it and ministering angels come, but we're caught between the two. It seems as if there's no relief in sight. And yet the Gospel of Mark says this is the beginning of the good news, the euangelion. What good news, Pastor Mike? Oh, there's good news. Verse 66, uh, the Greek word that's a conjunction, chi, is translated in the New Living Translation as meanwhile. I like that. If we were an African-American church right now, we'd have to have a meanwhile little ham and organ going, and I'd need to say, meanwhile, and I'd need to get going, and you would say, preach it, pastor, and some would say, amen, and you'd stand up and say, yes, Lord. So if you're feeling that you can type all that so I can see it, meanwhile. Peter was below in the courtyard, just, just outside, where Jesus is being pummeled and being mocked and saying, you prophet, prophesy to us. Just outside the courtyard, meanwhile. One of the servant girls was, who worked for the high priest noticed Peter warming himself at the fire. She looked at him closely and said, you were one of those with Jesus the Nazarene. Oh my goodness, hallelujah. Someone ought to shout because just outside the courtyard is the prophecy that Jesus then told Peter, you're going to deny me three times. The prophecy is happening just outside the courtyard. So while, 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 while the, the soldiers are pummeling and mocking and spitting upon the Son of God and they're hitting him, prophesy to us. He is prophesying. And just outside the courtyard is a prophecy that's taking place. What I'm saying to you is there's always a meanwhile in life when you think all hell is breaking loose and this is never going to work out. There's always a plan that God has for us. There is a meanwhile. There is a courtyard. What he spoke to you is going to happen. It always will happen. This is the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. Come Come on, saints of lambs. We have a lot to shout down. We have a lot to speak to and declare. And God has a promise. And if he spoke something to you, he's going to fulfill it. Several years ago, my, uh, my wife got really sick one night and uh, didn't know what it was. And we stayed up very, very late night. I had to end up taking her to the hospital. My wife is one tough woman. Um, she's a strong woman of God, and I, I married up, and, and as I say, I'm going to say multiple times, uh, she, she should get the largest crown in heaven with multiple jewels for just being married to me. She's an amazing, amazing woman. And so, so we took her to the hospital, found out she had a gallbladder issue, and a gallbladder surgery, it's not a big deal, pretty quick. Uh, we were in the hospital uh, nine days, and this wasn't, this wasn't 30 years ago. This was just a little over a decade ago. We were in the hospital nine days. Insurance issues and complications, and they didn't want to diagnose. Oh, my gosh. And I, I, want, to, I want to just suggest to you, sometimes we think that we're, st we're struggling with just human beings and just weird people, and people can be weird and people can be mean. But I believe that God is sovereign. I believe he masterminds situations that what hell meant for evil, God will use for good. If I can find a way to submit to that, I don't always do it. Uh, but if I can find a way to submit to that, it's amazing what God will do. So we're in the hospital. It's taken a while for, for them to schedule her for surgery. She is in agonizing pain. And I, I can't stand it when my wife's in pain. I, I'm trying to be as Christian as I can be, as godly as I can be, trying to talk to the nurses and the doctors to, to try and find out how when, when is she going to be scheduled for surgery and of course it took days and and we went through roommate after roommate and we're in this room and our third roommate came in um, and my wife finally after four days had just had the surgery she's in pain I'm loving on her and I'm trying to just be there for her and the nurses aren't being as nursey as you want them to be and I'm trying to be as kind as I can to get them in and help and and so uh, a 73 year old African American woman gets uh, wheeled in and she becomes our roommate and uh, of course I've got the curtains drawn um, I've sort of checked out as a pastor I'm really not there to pastor anybody I'm just I'm having a small attitude because it's been four days my wife's in pain she's finally had the surgery and and we're trying to get out but it's 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 just taken forever and so I, I, I'm hearing this group of people talk, and uh, they're all talking right next to us, and uh, I'm just loving on my wife, praying with her, and, uh, and they say, uh, gosh, does anybody know a pastor? They don't have a pastor. There must have been eight or nine of them in the room. Does anybody know a pastor? And again, I, I'm having a small attitude. I'm just being honest with you, and I, I'm sort of, I, I'm timed out. I, I clocked out. We never clock out. And even if I clock out as a pastor, I'm still a Christian, so I, I should be serving. And so I, I clocked out. 
and I'm listening to them. And, and so they said, well, they know someone who has a cousin who knows a friend. And so down the list, they go find this pastor. And an hour and a half later, this pastor comes in and, uh, and he begins to pray over them. And I'm, I'm thinking, finally, hallelujah. I'm glad they're being comforted. And, uh, and so he begins to pray and he prays the kindest uh, prayer of acceptance for death. And, and there's nothing wrong with that prayer. I don't mean to judge it at all. But in my heart, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, they brought you in to pray for comfort, for healing, for something miraculous, and you're just sort of conceding to death. I get, I get the reality of people are on their deathbeds, but I'm one of those people that I'm just going to fight for you. I'm going to go contend for the Father. Now I'm, now I'm irritated that this guy isn't praying uh, more aggressively and more faith-based. And so I, I, I stand up and I realize, oh my gosh, and I pop my head around the corner and I move the curtain and I, and I say to this group of people, um, I am so sorry. I've been listening to your whole conversation. I'm a pastor. Would you mind if I prayed for your, your mom? And of course, they're looking at me like, please come and pray for my mom. So I, I go over there and I, I stand next to her bed. I lean down in her ear and, and I whisper this to her. And I said a few other things. I said, um, uh, sister, and I, I just knew she was a sister at that moment. God just put that in my heart. I said, sister, it's not your time to die. Um, God is going to heal you. And I'm going to pray for you. So I, I, I then said some things to them. Uh, God has gifted me with a, a kind of a prophetic gift. So I said some things. Then everybody's crying. It's this amazing moment. And I pray over uh, the mom and I pray over everybody. And they're grateful. We, have, we, we, we had church. I mean, we just, God just showed up in the hospital. And so then I, 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 I dismiss myself, go back to my wife. Uh, about five minutes after I'm done, uh, there, there's all this commotion in the hallway. They, they wheel her out. And... Um, and, and they, there was all this noise, and, and I thought, I just, I'm just, I'm going to be honest with you, uh, with all this great faith that I had, I, I, I thought she probably died, uh, and that's what the commotion was. So uh, let it go. I, I didn't know what took place. I was busy with my wife. A couple of days later, a couple of days later, so nine days, nine days, a couple of days later, we're in another room, um, and uh, I walk in. It's a Friday. I still remember the day I walk in, and uh, and my and my wife Teresa sitting up in the chair, and she said, "So and so called." I didn't know who so and so was. She said, that's the daughter of the woman you prayed for. I said, oh. And uh, I, th I thought my wife was going to say, um, she called to say, thank you, my, my mom died. Uh, and uh, she said this, uh, she called and said, did you hear the commotion after your husband prayed for my mom? I said, yeah, we, we heard it. She said, my mom sat up in the bed. She was destined to die. They didn't think she was going to make. She sat up in the bed. We are not Christians. My mother is. We don't go to church, but we're going to. Uh, we, we want to find your God. And of course, I, I, I acted like I had faith the whole time. I said, well, of course, honey, that's what God would do. Uh, amazing. Nine days. Nine days for that woman. It's at my wife's expense. That was horrible. It was catastrophic. Meanwhile, meanwhile, in the courtyard, there's a prophecy going on. All hell may be breaking loose, saints of lambs. Meanwhile, there's a meanwhile in your life. Would you hold on to that? And may you know that the God that we love loves us far more than we could ever imagine. That you, men of God, are a son of, the, of, a, of a king, which makes you a prince. You need to declare, I am a prince. And you need to start acting like a prince. I don't mean haughty and arrogant. You have been granted and, and you have inherited all the kingdom has for you in and through Jesus. S daughters of the Lord, you are a daughter of, 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 the, of the king, which makes you a princess. So you need to declare, I'm a princess. And you need to walk in the authority and the grace and the beauty of a princess. So, so men of God, I am a prince. Woman of God, I am a princess. Would you walk in that? And would you, would you declare that this is the beginning of the good news of Jesus? Meanwhile, meanwhile, may you know how much your father loves you. May you know that his hand is always stretched out towards you. May you know that his grace will cover you. May you know that he will always, always be behind you, in front of you, and around you, and he will carry you. And may you know that he's empowered you in every way. May you walk in that grace in the name of the Father, the Son, and Spirit. Amen. God bless your lambs. Ah, uh, thank you, Pastor Mike. Thank you for the first of many sermons that will help us grow, all of us, grow deeper in our faith. And may we pause right here and set our hearts for a time 
of giving, giving back to the lion and the lamb and all the blessed ministries that the Lamb's Fellowship takes part in. So would you take this time to get your tithing together, your offerings together, your gifts together. And as we sing and as we praise, like we like to say here, the virtual ushers will come and receive the blessing.
again for allowing us to praise and pray to you. Thank you, Lord, for Pastor Mike teaching us. Thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit being present here with us. Lamb's Fellowship Lake Elsinore received the benediction from Ephesians 3, 17 through 19. It says, may Christ dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints, as Pastor Mike likes to tell us, with all the saints, what is the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth, and to know, and to know the full love of Jesus Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the goodness of God. Can I get an amen out there? Amen. All right, you're dismissed. We're going to praise for a few more minutes. God bless you guys. See you next week. May you have a